So um, I'm going to start with this very funny story that I just heard yesterday or the day before from a friend of mine. And he was asked by a close friend of his who was getting married to come house sit for them um, while they went on their honeymoon. But the key part of this house sitting was that his wife had this cat that she had brought into the marriage named Duke. And Duke was a very beloved cat, but not at all easy to get along with. Kind of a hostile indoor cat, but and had never really been out of the house. So it was just, per, you know, strong relationship to the wife, super important to the wife, never went out of the house, but didn't like other people. And so the tricky part of the house sitting was going to be taking care of this cat. So they left on their honeymoon Monday morning. He arrived on a business trip and was going to overlap and arrive at the house Monday, and they were going to be back Friday. So he arrives at the house Monday <clears throat> with the key, opens the door. As he opens the door, boom, the cat runs out the door. So his only job <laughs> was to take care of this cat. Cat runs out. Supposedly, it had never been out of the house. He looks for it. He looks for it. You know, drives around the neighborhood. Can't find the cat. Finally, just, OK, I'm giving up. <clears throat> Wakes up in the morning the next day, and there's the cat at the door. So he welcomes the cat back in, feeds the cat. And during the course of the week, he takes good care of the cat. And all of a sudden, the cat's not so hostile to him, warms up to him. He starts to enjoy petting the cat in the evening. Um, <clears throat> so he has to leave Friday. He leaves the house, you know, leaves Friday with uh, Duke fed and watered. Friend arrives back from the honeymoon on Friday. He calls, <clears throat> he calls Friday evening to say, how is everything? You know, is Duke OK? And he says, well. The cat is in really good shape, but it's not Duke. <laughs> so the cat that had re-entered the house Tuesday morning looked a lot like Duke to him. I mean, what did he know from Tabby Cat? Um, and so he had done a really excellent job of taking care of a cat that wasn't Duke. Um, <laughs> And the wife was obviously not super happy that she had a well-fed, uh, well-taken-care-of cat that wasn't Duke. Now, <laughs> I'm hoping this story has some point. Um, and I think part of the relevant point is, in trying to be effective, you only have to be wrong about one thing. He was actually a really effective taker care of cats. He was just wrong about one part of the causal structure, which is this cat wasn't the cat he was supposed to be taking care of. So, um, <clears throat> so I want to talk a bit about uh, you know, how we would form priorities and about what we should be doing, and a way in which I think we are often commonly wrong which I'm going to illustrate with one little kind of micro piece of evidence. It's a macro piece of evidence, but it's one small piece of evidence. But I think it, it illustrates a way in which in our attempt to do good things, we often go wrong. So I think a lot of us, I hope, this is a very optimistic view, um, is we kind of have a normative objective function that helps us frame what we're doing. What am I going to research on? What am I going to act like? What am I going to fund? What am I going to do? We have this idea of how we would like the world to be more prosperous, more equitable, safer, cleaner, you know, <clears throat> safer for women, children less, all kinds of objectives we might have. And then we kind of have a positive model of the world that specifies a causally connected dynamics that says if the world were to be perturbed, from its existing state in the following way, that would lead to a positive dynamic that would accomplish this normative objective I have. The world would be a better place by what I do because I'm connecting my actions through a series of causal connected to a set of dynamics. Um, now, <clears throat> one of the uh, uh, sort of tabby cat one, right, Duke, is that we live in a world with really simple and well, easy to understand dynamics. 
So we've kind of got a graph, and <laughs> this is easy to understand dynamics. Um, <laughs> we've got a graph with one good thing that maybe we have some causal control over, and it's related and observed cross-national. Um, is there a? Uh, I knew I would do something stupid. Um, yes. So there's this stable observed cross-national relationship where you know this, these two good things tend to go strongly together. So we observe countries like Denmark with both of these good things and countries like Chad with neither of these good things. And so there's some empirical reason to believe they go together. And we, believe that we can believe they go together in some dynamics in which if we move this thing, it creates a dynamic to restore the equilibrium along this cross-sectional relationship by moving that direction. So if we perturb it and make more of this good thing, the dynamics lead to more of the other good thing, which explains and is consistent with there being this stable cross stable relationship, right? That's how they go together, because this dynamics, if you're off of this, there's a dynamic that leads you back to that, and it leads you back to that in a positive way. And in this kind of dynamics, um, kind of <laughs> the way you should prioritize your actions is you should make G1, good thing go as far as possible, as fast as possible, whenever possible. Because the more you can do, the more you're going to get out of it, right? The more you can crank this up, the higher you're going to crank that up. And it's kind of win-win. And, and now, a lot of, believe it or not, <laughs> a lot of what I've heard in this conference is saying, and Jim Robinson really explicitly saying, that oftentimes our world doesn't look like this good, simple, easy to understand dynamics. It's this more complicated dynamics that I can see had a third grader's ability to draw um, <laughs> in a PowerPoint slide, in which there is this stable cross-national relationship, but it doesn't exist because there's a simple positive re-equilibrating dynamics. Um, it exists because <laughs> there is a dynamic where you're inside, in some sense, some narrow corridor bounds in which um, more gives you more. So up here and within those bounds, we have those simple dynamics. So if we make this go up, that goes up. And we, inside the narrow corridor, this is what I call hard slog development, that you recognize you're making a series of small incremental jumps, and those have a positive dynamic within incrementalism. But if you actually were able to jump to there, you would be outside the incremental dynamics, and this would set off a negative dynamic, which would move backwards with respect to the other good thing. And then uh, there might be eventually in these dynamics a way that you lead back to where you're actually at, at to the same point or worse than you were before. So this is a very um, worrisome state of the world, because in this world, Trying to do too much of a good thing does positive harm. And it's not, nobody's debating that these are both good things. Nobody's debating that these things go together in the strong association. Um, <clears throat> and <laughs> a lot of the deals and development work and a lot of the, you know, explicitly James Robinson's narrow corridor work is suggesting the dynamics of the world might be incredibly more complicated than the kind of simple good dynamics that kind of all things go together and because they're associated, we push on one, we'll get more of the other. So let me, um, <clears throat> wow, I, I was blaming Jim for his troubles, but okay. So amazingly, we have some modest quantitative evidence in a joint paper um, that suggests that this might be true and in that good law actually creates bad outcomes. Um, or we might call this why beautiful law creates terrible outcomes, in which we can actually show that <clears throat> creating a law that would be more restrictive actually creates less compliance by undermining the ability to implement 
and the underlying capability to implement such that you can actually create a negative dynamic between implementation and the law through being over ambitious with respect to what you try and do with the law. So let, let's just illustrate, and it's kind of a, <clears throat> if you think of, so if you think of organizational capability in two dimensions, one is kind of, think of an army, and an army has its ability to inflict damage on the enemy when it's not actually facing an enemy. <laughs> this is the parade ground kind of ability. Like how often can you fire, you know, how rapidly can you fire your weapons, how accurately can you fire your weapons when no one's shooting back. So this is the zero stress capability, but then that capability eventually deteriorates with battlefield stress. The whole point of battlefield stress is it reduces your capability from your ideal and at some threshold, an army disintegrates into a mob, it loses its ability to act cohesively, and its battlefield capability deteriorates massively nonlinearly. It doesn't like gradually erode. You can go from having capability to like not having capability at all when the kind of effectiveness of the organization deteriorates um, by being put under too much stress. And so, um, you know, what we call a paper tiger is an organization that looks good on paper, has the uniforms, has the epaulets, can march in a straight line, can shoot its guns on the battle, on the parade ground, but deteriorates very quickly under stress. And this doesn't matter the size of that army, if it doesn't actually have this robustness with respect to stress, it can't be effective. So <clears throat> then you can kind of think of, I'm going to skip this for a second. Um, and you could think of the same thing with respect to try things the government tries to do. You could say, I'm trying to collect taxes, <clears throat> and my tax collection agency has certain capability to collect taxes when no one kind of <laughs> puts up resistance to collection of taxes. But when I send my actual agents out to assess your property, it's in your individual self-interest, and maybe you escape this due to solidarity, to have your property low at a very low valuation, given the rate. And hence, there's some pressures for the property tax agents to collude in the valuation of properties in a way that undermines the objective of collecting property taxes. And you can imagine a tax code that basically creates such incentives for individuals to resist it that it overwhelms the organizational capability to enforce it. And you end up in this low level equilibrium of a really powerful tax code that would, if implemented, collect a lot of revenue, but collects almost no revenue in part because it undermines the capability of the agency to do it by creating an environment in which there's more stress on the organization from the resistance to implementation than the organization is capable of enforcing. Okay? Now, the, the tricky thing about illustrating any of that is, uh, wow, um, is, so the controversial thesis would be to say, transplanting good and especially best practice, um, and that's across a variety of things, tax, business regulation, environment, um, safety, actually destroys capability and causes the big stuck. <laughs> because once you're in the low capability trap, you can't build capability from that trap because the stress that you're under always exceeds your ability to expand capability. So I could, you know, I could take a sort of dysfunctional organization, I could have training courses, I could pay higher wages, I could do all kinds of things, but unless I remove the stress that's causing the organization to cause it to, cause it to collapse, I can never fix it. I can't fix it in place. You can't train an army in the middle of a rout. If your soldiers are running away <laughs> and disorganized and in chaos, like you have to <laughs> um, you have to get them back out of a stress situation to reconstitute their effectiveness. Um, so good law destroys the rule of law. So the rule of law, which is the implementation of law, can actually be undermined by really attractive laws. Um, now, the, the hard thing about this, <laughs> of course, is coming up with any evidence at all. Wonderful theory, great story, started with a joke about a cat. 
although my friend said it's a true story. Um, <clears throat> but it turns out we can illustrate this with actual data about one specific thing. And the beauty of it is, is um, the World Bank created a data set called the Doing Business Indicators that a lot of governments around the world pay attention to that sort of tell you the number of days it would take you for a given business, for a given kind of construction to get a construction permit um, if one were to follow the law. <laughs> and this is a de jure measure of the time for regulatory compliance and there's one observation per country per year. So it kind of says, in this country, how long would it take you to get a construction permit if you were of a firm of this type in a given place? Uh, commercial warehouse is the standard thing you're constructing. Now, the beauty of the World Bank, and I worked at the many World Bank for many years, is it's so big it can do contradictory things. <laughs> so you would think no organization would actually create the data that allowed it to prove that its own data was wrong. <laughs> and you're right, no well-controlled organization would. But they actually went out and did the doing the enterprise survey in these same countries, not always, but many times, in which they asked firms who had constructed something how long it actually took them to get a permit. So a number of interesting features of comparing these two sets of data. The first is that the median of the doing business days across all countries in the world is 190 days. Um, this is the distribution of reported times <laughs> in which nearly all of the reported times are below 45 days. Um, the, the roughly a third of all the firms report a time less than 15 days. So <laughs> the law says 190, six months. A third of the firms report less than two weeks. Um, uh, another third report less than 45, and then uh, and the and the minimum of any country in the sample of the doing business is 60. So nearly all firms in the world report actual times for compliance less than the most relaxed country in the world reports as the legal. So, what you then see, what you see is, um, okay. So, and what you see is for individual countries, you will often see the doing business indicator reporting a time that essentially no firm in the country reports. So this is the data for Sudan. Um, nearly all countries in Sudan report a time to compliance less than 15 days. So everybody who did build something in Sudan built it with compliance times less than, um, less than 15 days. There's a little spike here. At, these are focal points of a survey. A few say 30, a few say 60, um, kind of in units of months. The actual doing, the doing business number was 270. Like no firm reported actually the compliance time that the de jure appraisal of the World Bank said it would take you. So the difference between this is that the rules in a chaotic environment, the rules don't matter. Like nobody is following the rules. You're, you're obtaining deals. You are one way or another, either by pure non-compliance, by some accommodation with a local official, or by a large-scale deal with powerful national politicians, you are evading having to comply with the law. Um, and so <laughs> there's a famous scene from the movie Butch Cass and the Sundance Kid where this giant wants to have a knife fight to the death with Butch. And so Butch says, well, what are the rules? <laughs> and the response is, there's no rules in a knife fight. What do you mean rules? Um, at, which point Butch, <laughs> at which point Butch kicks him in the uh, genitals and the fight is over. He says, no rules? Great. Okay. So um, here's so what we did in this empirical paper that's just come out is now we actually have some possibility of observing compliance gaps. 
which are very hard to observe because, again, mostly what gets reported are the de jure, which are mostly a fiction, and the actual reality almost never gets reported, which is what actually happens. And so we look country by country at um, uh, both the kind of distribution of reported compliance times and the doing business indicator. And then we look for um, this interactive effect that says, if in your country the doing business indicator is 100 days higher, right? How much less likely is the firm, less or more likely, to report a compliance time under 15 days? So we're looking at the proportion of firms that report quick deals, because we largely believe that the quick deals involve not achieving the regulatory objectives of the regulation in the first place. If you're only taking 10 days to get a construction permit, whatever purpose that regulatory action had, it's probably not being complied with you're probably escaping the regulatory compliance altogether. Now, <clears throat> what we find is that, first of all, not surprisingly, um, if you just run a regression, irrespective of state capability, it's increasing the permit days by 100 days, decreases slightly by about 7% the likelihood you got a quick deal. Now, first of all, you <laughs> If you think about it, uh, it should have driven it completely to zero, right? You've increased it by 100 days and you're still asking for firms if it took them less than 15. So the increment of 100 days of the law to actual compliance on average is small. But more interestingly, we interacted this effect. So what is the effect of the law, or uh, effect, but the association of the law being 100 days higher in low capability versus high capability states. And we found in low capability states, <clears throat> in fact, increasing the law by 100 days increased the probability you got the permit in less than 15. So this is clear evidence <laughs> that um, higher levels of the law was associated with lower levels of compliance. And such, again, such low levels of compliance, our argument is that the public purpose of the regulation is no longer being met, right? Although we don't have any. Um, and then even more kind of interactive terms reveal that if you're like Sudan and you start off with a, you know, and then we say, how much does this affect, uh, affect you when you've got already high regulation versus already low regulation? And if you were a low capability country, if you were low capability and already had high regulation, it raised the probability that raising the regulation would reduce compliance times. So almost the median com capability country would observe no would observe no reduction or increase in compliance times or reduced probability of having a quick deal from having increased their legal regulation by 100 days so what <clears throat> so again this is just this is an empirical illustration of something I think is actually a very common phenomenon in the developing world, which is countries have beautiful laws, beautiful policies, best practice on the books, and they actually have no rule of law at all. Because the law would require such incredibly high levels of capability to implement it, higher than the capability you actually have, you reach a low level equilibrium of beautiful law no rule of law. You move into an environment in which, given how stringent it would be to comply with the law, um, I have to form a deal with the system to evade the law in some way, which then makes it, <clears throat> so it would be very costly to do business according to the law, so deals emerge that allow firms to do business and the feature of large successful firms is their ability to secure favorable deals. 
Again, I, <laughs> what it means to be a successful firm is not necessarily that you're the most productive firm in terms of your physical productivity, but you are productive at profitability, and your productivity at profitability has more to do with being able to have a favored deal than it necessarily has to do with your production capability. Um, and whatever organized capability there is for implementation um, is weakened, and hence um, you, you, you arrive at this perfect storm in which nobody really has the power to change this. So suppose I was talking about some environmental regulation and you had really powerful and attractive environmental regulation of what firms should do, but all the powerful firms who were essentially evading that through some kind of deal arrived at with the implementation, who wants to make the law more reasonable? Well, if you go to the environmental advocates and say, I know, I have a great idea. I'm going to reduce the stringency of the law. And by the way, given how far away from the frontier you are, it would be a massive reduction to get anywhere near the reality. Right? Again, the reality is a median of 30 and a law of 180. Well, advocates for the environment are going to like go to the mattresses, as they say, to avoid that. So they don't want it. So the advocates of the, of the outcome don't want it. And the powerful firms don't want it. Because after all, <laughs> I'm making profits by not having to comply. But by the same token, the state can prevent any entry into my industry by forcing them to comply. So there was a famous saying of a Latin American president, and when I use this, various Latin Americans compete to say, oh, that was my president that said that. Um, <clears throat> for my friends, anything. For my enemies, the law. I don't need to go out of my way to prevent my political friends from having competition. I just need to enforce the law. Because the law as it stands is <laughs> so different than the deal that is being provided to the powerful interests that without the deal you can't do business. Uh, and finally, the organization responsible for implementation accommodates itself as to the role of rent collector or mediator and doesn't actually have any power of increasing it. And um, so let me, uh, I, I use this example of, uh, an attempt to like increase the attendance of nurses in Rajasthan, India, where they introduce some super well-designed whiz-bang thing um, and tracked it with an RCT. And the result was absence of the nurses went down, but presence went down too. <laughs> so the number of nurses physically present also fell. And you might say, well, they must have been absent or present. And then I laugh, <laughs> what kind of bureaucracy have you ever worked in? <laughs> there was a category called exempt from duty, which meant you were absent from the duty station, but counted as present for purposes of compensation. That went from about less than 10% of the nurses to half of all days of nurses were exempt from duty. So again, the attempt to actually get tougher on a, a dysfunctional organization made it worse because actually the number of nurses there fell from 45, which was disastrous, to only 30%, on average only 3 in 10 were physically present. And it was worse because fiction replaced fact. Because the next time when you came to the government of Rajasthan and said, oh, you have an absenteeism problem you need to solve, you know what they said? No, we don't. We have best practice levels of absence. <laughs> We're under 10%. So um, let me just conclude with this slide, which is um, a kind of, again, back to this illustration of suppose we have state capability for implementation and we have laws. Um, you might think the way to improve the environment or gender or safe workplace safety, or the education of children, would it be work on a law that specifies really strong and important compliance measures, or a law called a right to education 
that dictated exactly what had to happen. But it's perfectly plausible, <laughs> given some evidence about dynamics, that this would push you out of the narrow corridor of a positive dynamic into a fiction replaces fact dynamic in which you lose even further control of the organization and you lose whatever positive dynamic there was versus what I call capability first approaches which is rather than trying to improve the ideal and hope capability follows you actually start by saying what would make this organization stronger at accomplishing its objectives within the current law, within the current structures, and then have the law follow the practice. So this is what I call capability first implementation, or capability first approaches. Um, and <laughs> I would argue <laughs> you should focus on the capability first approaches and get rid of the experts that are telling you to adopt best practice. The consultants are out there peddling best practice solutions. The development agencies are out there telling you, here is what you need to accomplish. All kinds of pressures are on development agents um, <clears throat> to engage in premature load bearing. And these are vectors of this disease, and you have to get rid of them. You have to ignore them, because they are not, in fact, <laughs> Swat them if they land on you, like you would a mosquito, because they are transmitting a disease that is not going to help you accomplish your objectives. And when they say, oh, but if you just had this law like Norway does, no. <laughs> That's not what we're going to do. We're going to start from where we are, build our capability towards what we want to do, rather than entering the la-la land of Donorville um, by specifying completely unachievable programs and targets written by donors sitting in capital cities to please their constituencies and not pay attention to the local realities. Thank you very much.